Okay, we're just about ready to get started with the um, second afternoon session for the System Administration Mini-Conf. If you're planning on being he in here, um, come in and take your seats. All right, welcome back. Um, we have three talks before we close. Um, the first talk is Stephen Ellis, who's going to talk to us about turtles all the way down and layers and layers of LVM. All right, thank you all for coming along. Uh, how many of you uh, were at my talk at Geelong last year? OK, so there's a few of you. So well, this is kind of a continuation of some of that story about you know, thin and trim and playing with LVM and a few tips and tricks around KVM. So, um, let's see if the clicker wants to work. Yeah, we, we appear to have music in the back. Yes, thank you. <laughs> right, so um, one of the reasons for the subtitle is along the way I've broken environments countless times and in a way, I've been trying to resolve problems uh, that hit me regularly when I'm building test environments, building demo environments, trying things out with my customers, or simply trying to keep my laptop alive. Um, how many of you heard the term turtles all the way down before? So there's obviously a few Terry Pratchett fans in the audience because it's come up through that, but it long predates Terry. And so one of the whole you know, mythological ideas is, you know, the, the flat earth syndrome and the earth being carried through the galaxy on the back of, you know, four elephants on the back of a giant turtle. And someone says, what's the turtle standing on? Oh, it's turtles all the way down. So in the context of this, it's, it's talking about things like, how do you deal with trim or discard when you have many layers in the way? Because as we see SSDs become more prevalent, both on your laptops and in the enterprise, this is going to start to become increasingly important. So we'll talk a little bit about why trim's important. Uh, initial introduction to our turtle. We'll talk about turtles, virtual turtles, migrating turtles, nesting turtles, and for those of an alternative disposition, cows. And we may follow this up with some redundant turtles. And then because I did promise KVM, we've got an extra KVM tip and trick at the end that I hope you will find useful. But we'll touch on virtualization, particularly around KVM and LibVirt during this talk. So why trim? Why does it matter? If you have an SSD and you want to maximize your performance, you need to enable discard. You need to be able to pass down your delete request to the underlying flash storage, or things don't go so well. I found my work laptop had filled up. Slowly, my performance degraded dramatically. The expected lifetime of my SSD will decrease because blocks are not being reallocated correctly because the underlying hardware thinks they're all being used by your file systems. So really, you need file system support as well as OS support for trim for things to behave well. Why turtles? Well, different layers. We're going to build this up. So a simple example is you have your SSD, some, a partition table, maybe a file system. Maybe we'll put LVM in the way. I mean, that's quite common these days, our root file system, our swap on, on LVM. In the case of my day-to-day -day environment, I have encryption in the way. I use uh, Lux encryption, and then I have LVM on top of that. Or maybe I'm going to run KVM. Maybe I'm going to use a thin pool of LVM with KVM to spin up some VMs which have got their own partition tables, their own file systems, their own environments. How do I make sure a delete request here goes all the way down to here through all the layers? There are many turtles in the way. So simple example, you're using an SSD with a file system. Most modern file systems support discard. You can either use a tool like FS Trim to run it manually or there's a scheduled job, or you may enable it periodically through turning on discard on your FS tab. Swap just works. Um, if you're playing around with embedded devices, Android, IoT-type devices, and using things like F2FS, it takes care of that automatically. 
I got a huge performance boost on my tablet by moving key file systems to F2FS. It didn't worry about having to run trim. Things behave nicely. It's a, it's a nicely developing file system. And then to confirm it's working, LSBLK, some options, and you'll get some feedback on the underlying file system. You'll see if trim is effectively working. Now, all this content will be available afterwards if you want to copy and paste or reuse anything. Next layer up, I'm going to put K, uh, LVM in the way. Enable discards in your LVM conf. Then it should behave nicely. Fairly simple. Everything else applies. We're layering. Everything you've learned before makes sense, which is throwing another layer in. Crypt. Now, I mentioned this last year when I was in Geelong that I, I couldn't quite get it working. And it turns out it was working. I just, it, a kernel update had fixed it. So if you're using things like dmcrypt with Lux, you need to enable it in your crypt tab. You need to rebuild, depending on your distribution, your init image so that it boots correctly with discard being passed through. Now, some people say with uh, encryption you shouldn't enable discard because effectively it shows which bits of the file system aren't, are, are zero, therefore it pro provides a better attack vector. Yes and no. Look, at the end of the day, the amount of data on my laptop far exceeds the amount of non-data. Right? It's still going to be fairly hard to crack. I've currently got a terabyte of SSD in here, and it's fairly full at the best of times. So I want that drive to stay alive. Um, this is Chris's blog on some tips on enabling LVM and Lux on an SSD. Next layer up, we want to play with, say, thin pools. Great thing about LVM, creating thin pools so that we can deal with sparse environments on top of LVM. So create a, an initial 80 gig thin pool. And then within it, I'm going to create a 40 gig image for my VM. And it will only consume whatever I'm really using. Again, providing things like this card pass through correctly. And then it should pass all the way down to my underlying storage. For a long time, I had an external hard drive. It was my old 128 gig SSD for my laptop, USB attached. The whole thing was simply a thin pool. I had the equivalent of a terabyte or more of VMs on it. At least that's what they thought. Thanks to thin, I could do environments and snapshots and play with an awful lot of technologies on a 128 gig SSD. So now we're going to throw KVM in the way. Um, if you want to do a pass-through of those requests with KVM, you need to change your environment slightly. You need to make sure your machine type is greater than 2.1 for discard to work. You need to add discard to your hard disk definition, discard equal on map. And then you need to actually use the VertIO SCSI driver. In fact, I recommend these days is you don't use the traditional VertIO driver for any uh, libvert slash KVM based storage, move over to VertIO SCSI just as your default. It allows for a much larger number of disks and this card works correctly. And that appears to be the area that the community is investing in from a performance, uh, bug fix, et cetera perspective. So trim in a VM, again, everything we previously talked to applies. Everything passes down. So if you want it to behave nicely, you need to apply FS trim or discard settings within your VM. If it's got LVM, again, edit your LVM.conf. And if you've got Lux, just don't. I mean, why? I mean, it's bad enough I'm encrypting here, but we want to go and encrypt up there. Yes, occasionally for ad hoc environments, you're trying something out, you're given an environment that is encrypted. But why are you wanting to encrypt twice? There may be reasons. Where possible, just don't do it. I haven't tested that scenario. Your mileage may vary. If it works, please send me a note. Are you trim? Boot and test your VM or try it out in your primary environment. I said LSBLK, mount point, disk max, FS type is your options. Disk max should show a value greater than zero. That means that that partition has trim correctly enabled. You can then test it, FS trim minus V, and it tells me it's trimming correctly. And I don't know why the video's playing up. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to close that. Okay, fat to thin. If you've got an existing virtual disk image that's been given to you .img, .wherever, and you want to go and import it and turn it into a thin image, how do you deal with that? There's the painful way, which is one I talked to last year about using tools like kpartex and fstrim. Using kpartex, you can take a, an image file, treat it as a pseudo disk, get DevMapper to mount it, and then you can go through and it's a convoluted process, and you've got to mount volumes and trim them and unmount them, and then everything's good. Awesome. KPartex is a cool tool. It's a great way to go and introspect an environment and, and, and try it out with actually booting the VM. But it's a lot easier now because VertSparsify exists in most distributions. So you simply say, VertSparsify in place the uh, LVM. Uh, partition or uh, LV, or you can vert sparsify uh, directly from an image and tell it its destination happens to be uh, on LVM and it will sparsify the environment for you and strip it down. It also works against things like QCAL. And then you can use LVS uh, to check in your LVM environment that it's actually thin and sparse. Thin to thin. I need to move environments around. You, have, you maybe want to move them between hard drives. You may want to move them between systems. And so there's a painful way, there's a sparse way, and there's a way to deal with uh, uh, adding in some simple compression. So the painful way is just do a straight DD between endpoints via a SSH session, or you maybe you'll just open a, a netcat port and pipe your data across. You've got gigabit LAN, it's great. I'll move the environment around get a nice fat LV at the far end, and then we'll go through that kpartex process. Nah, too hard. Use VertSparsify. Great, it'll clean it up. Or, again, here's a netcat example. I'm going to run a listener on my destination. I'm going to specify where I want it to go, and I'm going to say conv equals sparse. Over here, I'm going to run the input, my guest. I'm going to send it over to host B. And at the end, I'd recommend running a vert sparsify anyway, because it just helps clean up any rats and mice, saves you a bit of extra disk space. But this over here will result in a sparse environment. I like using LZOP when I'm dealing with certain uh, like um, network restricted environments. You might have lower bandwidth. It's a fairly, fairly lightweight form of compression. It's very fast. It's fairly efficient. So again, LZOP over here. This is to decrypt and read from input. And then down here, I'll do LZOP minus minus fast. That could be minus one. It's the fastest, um, encryption, uh, fastest compression it will use. And this is really handy when you're dealing with some more bandwidth restricted environments. In general, if you go in SSD to SSD, uh, it may have struggled to keep up. But then if your constraint happens to be you're pushing it over Wi-Fi or over a lower bandwidth internet connection or something, then it may make up quite a big difference. Even with you doing sparse at this end, you're, not, you're actually pushing, uh, I think, the blocks at this end, and then I've sparsify at the end. Right? So even though here is sparse saying don't write the uh, zeros, you're effectively pushing the zeros here. So you do get quite a big benefit. If there's any way to specify sparse at both endpoints, let me know. I haven't found anything sane right now that seems to work. Nesting turtles. So as if we've not got enough layers, let's throw some more in the way. So I've got my physical host with an SSD partition table, maybe encryption. So I'm using this color now to say that's a bit optional my thin pool with KVM and a virtual disk. And that virtual disk has a partition table, maybe with encryption, because I'm crazy. So more LVM, maybe another thin pool. And I'm nesting through KVM on an entire new environment, because I'm trying to build a cloud on my laptop. I'm hosting a, a whole OpenStack build. I'm playing with Overt or um, uh, Red Hat virtualization or some other technology where I need to build hypervisors, which need to think they're on bare metal. 
so I can run out of storage very, very quickly. So yeah, there's a few layers. The first thing, if you're going to nest, there's a few settings for Intel processors. There's no side effect to enabling all of them. It will only turn them on if they're valid for your CPU core. So um, that's the basic. And then these will apply dependent on the class of Xeon or other processor you've got. AMD, I don't, think that, I don't know of any advanced options yet. Pretty much just turn on nesting. You're good to go. That's on your guest, on your, on your physical host. And then your first layer up will think you can now nest. Cows. Now, a lot of people use QCOW rather than LVM. I like using LVM and thin LVM. But occasionally, I'm playing around with environments where I've just got a straight QCOW image I want to spin up. In theory, all the same rules apply. Not always. I do sometimes struggle to get QCOW to properly discard all the way through or properly trim. Uh, I'm usually only using it in environments where I'm playing for a short period of time and then throwing them away, very ephemeral environments. I'm using something like Atomic as an environment to play around with containers. Then QCOW is really nice. I can take a QCOW image. I can create um, three snapshots of it and build a small environment and then tear it all down again. Uh, you can run VertSparsify, as I said earlier, directly against the underlying QCOW disk or convert an existing raw image into a QCOW environment if you want to go and sparsify it. Again, the same rules apply within the machine type, etc., for KVM. So if you're spinning up a QCAM image inside KVM and you're doing it on the command line using some um, you know, uh, command line tools, make sure you specify that it's a vert IO SCSI device and that you tell uh, um, discard equal on map in your disk settings. Otherwise, things won't be very clean. Raid and trim. So we're now talking about redundant turtles. So I've got two SSDs. I'll maybe use... MDADM RAID 1, I'll have my MD, my LVM, and my file system. Or some people today would use your SSDs, two partitions, and then use LVM RAID 1 over the top. How many of you have used LVM RAID? Ooh, very few. How many of you used MDADM RAID? Lots. Yeah, I, I oh, debugging this? Yeah, OK. Debugging this? Uh, I'm not sure yet. OK? I actually had to recover a RAID 6 failure with one of these recently, where I lost three out of five disks. That was an interesting weekend I lost, but um, I got the data back. So MDADM discard is passed through correctly now. Subject to your kernel version and distro. One warning is initialization, in effect, can write through to all blocks. And that can have an impact on performance until you start trimming things and freeing things up. Um, a lot of the distro documentation and a lot of upstream documentation actually recommend that you use LVM-based RAID 1. Less initialization overhead. It doesn't write to all blocks. It just puts some metadata in place, and then you're good to go. So in theory, on SSDs, this should be better. I'd love to hear from anyone who's trying it and get some feedback. So I haven't tried this out yet. My, uh, one of my play pens is set up this way. Seems to behave nicely. The stats I'm getting off the underlying SSD seem to make sense. So one of the things I offered you was some KVM tips and tricks. Well, we've actually done some. We've got how to do trim and discard using Vert Sparsify to help you clean up VM images. Nesting on KVM. What I most like is being able to do a KVM serial console with libvert. Makes life a lot easier for analyzing remote environments, even if you're using things like uh, overt or Red Hat virtualization, where it's a managed hypervisor. There's still ways for you to spin up a serial console if you need to go in and debug a system directly off the hypervisor. So and one of the things here is not just to offer a serial console so you can log in. It's a serial console so you can interact with Grub going to go all the way down into this. So if you're going to do it, we need to modify a few things. We need to modify ETC default grub on, a, on like a, a, a rel 
CentOS, Oracle Linux, Fedora type system. Um, please adjust based on your distro. You need to, and it's normally set to Grub Terminal Console. You need to enable serial. We need to specify serial settings. And then the, on the Grub command line option in that file, I like to remove RHGB choir. If I'm ha hacking and testing these environments, I want to see all the boot logs. I want to know what's going on when it starts up. I want something weird happening because I am deciding to encrypt this guest. I want to know when encryption's not quite working correctly. So, um, and then I need to add to it the following console output settings so that post, so that I get to see things through a VNC or SPICE type session, as well as on the underlying uh, libvirt console. And then I need to rebuild my grub config, reboot, or actually power off, because a reboot's too fast. It doesn't quite, you won't see it the first time through if you do a reboot. And then you're all good to go. And you can actually see Grub, and you can log in on the console using Versha console, not just through um, Spice or VNC. So I thought, well, I do this a lot. So I'll just create a little Ansible playbook. So if anyone wants this, go there. There's a playbook called grubconsole.yaml. Pull requests welcome for other distributions. I'd love to see it extended so it makes sense for other distros. There's a little playbook I've written that, that encapsulates this. So, so here, if you can all see that, I have started a version console. I've started a, a little baby RHEL 7 environment. This could be any distro, and right now it's come up with a serial console, but I have no output, I have no way of interacting with it. I could go and fire up a GUI tool and bring up a VNC or Spice type session to connect and interact with it. Over here, I've actually logged in, I've SSH'd in, because it's an existing environment I can play with, and there's kind of the standard grub configuration. That's all the default settings that you're going to have. So adjust based on your distribution. Over here, I've got the playbook that's now up in GitHub that you can all go and play with. Now, the fun bit about this was getting the regex right for some of the inserts, because the point about Ansible is you want to be able to run a playbook as many times as you want and always get the same known end outcome. Right? You don't want to keep adding lines to the grub config or adjusting things that don't make sense. So, say destination, I'm going to go modify the grub config. I'm going to make sure that the line grub terminal says serial and console. I'm going to insert the line grub serial command because in, if it's not there. And I've got two regexes here. On the grub command line, I'm going to strip out RHGB quiet. And then the last one, which is this world of crazy turns out what didn't make sense to me, the regex, but that was looking to see that console TTY, et cetera, doesn't exist at the end of the command line and insert the correct value. And to tidy things up, I've got a notify handler and it goes and does a grub to MK config. Now this, if you're using other distributions, I'd really love to have, again, a pull request so that we can go and you know, extend this so it will work for any distribution. So quickly run that. Because what, what used to happen is like any desk procedure, I know what I'm doing, I can do copy and paste, but you'd regularly get one character wrong and things wouldn't quite behave correctly. And there's nothing like grub going bad on you to really spoil your day. So, I was great at debugging grub. Grub 2? Mm, yeah, I'm getting there. Anyway, so now it's been reconfigured with my changes. Oh, that's the other tip. Versha start minus minus console. 
instead of doing versus start and then versus console and finding it's already gone further than you really wanted it to do. So now I have full access. I can go and modify grub settings, go and tell it to boot into single mode, single user mode or uh, override uh, system D settings. And when the machine boots, I'll get a login prompt and I can go and interact with it over, a, over the libvirt serial console. So that's everything I've got. This content will be up on my Red Hat page shortly, and I'll also pass a copy back to the team after the event. Um, any questions, any comments, anything I've got hopelessly wrong? Oh, uh, side effects of FS trim and discard on um, file systems that do lots of scrubbing like uh, XFS and BTRFS. I don't run BTRFS. I like my data too much. Um, ooh. Uh, so, no, I haven't gone that deep. The only thing I have kind of looked at is things like health stats against SSDs. Um, I originally, my laptop shipped with a 128 that was never going to be any use, so we put a 256 in. Pretty soon that became really, really sluggy. The moment I started applying some of these things, my performance improved dramatically. Admittedly, I've now got a newer generation of SSD with copious space. Uh, but I like to apply these things because I tend to spin up a lot of ephemeral environments, collapse them down again. So I want to make sure that stuff's getting passed through. But I haven't really looked at the impact. The only thing I have looked at is the difference between, say, XFS versus F2FS on things like Android, which is just phenomenal. Uh, just F2FS rocks. Any more? Uh, one more. You talked about the difference between the um, LVM rated versus non-LVM. Do you have any hints on performance between those two? Just for a single <coughs> stripe. No, I don't. I've got a friend who's been playing around with the um, LVM RAID. I mean, right now it's like, uh, how many versions of RAID do we need in, in the Linux uh, subsystem? So I uh, know I haven't actually looked at any key differences there. Um, and it all starts to get a little bit fuzzy around the edges when you start throwing SSDs under the hood as well. Suddenly you move from spinning ROS to SSDs. And you, I've got a, my home playpen has a pair of um, 500 gig Crucials RAID 1 that I, I run stuff on. And I really don't care anymore. Things are just so fast. It's just a world of difference that I'm, I'm happy. But when we start looking at this in an enterprise construct, and you're starting to see more white box hardware in the enterprise that you may have SSDs in, this is going to start to become cru crucial because you don't want to be swapping out SSDs the way you were spinning out, uh, um, swapping out Rust in the past. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your time. Oh, you got one more? Mm -hmm. there. So you mentioned the utility vert sparsify. Is there any difference between that that does something specific to the disk images rather than, for example, a file locate that can handle any generic file and sparsify that? Basically, is there anything special about the disk images in that case? No. Um, if you vert sparsify, it'll step you through what it's doing to the image, but it's effectively mounting the f looking for file systems and then sparsifying into the file systems it's all based around uh, i think uh, guestfish um, guestfs libguestfs which is a, an interface for interacting with uh, file system images so um doesn't do anything overly special but it's a nice wrapper it just works okay 
that, oh, no, are sorry, we done? that's okay. all we've got time for. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs>